Hello and welcome. I'm Alison Markin Powell, Japanese literary translator and former co chair of the Penn Translation Committee. My co host today is Larissa Kaiser, whom many of you will recognize from our week five program on the 2020 Manifesto on Translation. Larissa is an award winning translator from the Icelandic and a current co chair of the Penn Translation Committee, as well as a co organizer of Translating the Future, the conference you're now attending. Thank you, Allison, and thank you all for joining us for the 17th installment of our weekly program on translating the classics. Today's conversation will feature Lori Patton, who has translated the Bhagavad Gita and is also president of Middlebury College, the sponsor of today's program. Lori will be joined by Gopal Suku, a translator of classical Chinese poetry and professor at Queens College, and Vivek Narayanan, a poet, writer, editor, and translator who is a former fellow at the Coleman Center, one of our conference partners. You can read their full and illustrious bios on the Center for the Humanities website. We've just finished celebrating the seventh year of August as Women in Translation Month, which aims to highlight women and non-binary writers and translators to address gender disparity in the field of literary translation. The past year saw the publication of more classics appearing in their first translations by women, including Michael Nyland's The Art of War by Swinsa and Maria Devana Headley's Beowulf. In her translator's note to her edition of the Odyssey, Emily Wilson rejects the quote, gendered metaphor of the faithful translation, whose worth is always secondary to that of a male authored original. Instead, she points to a translator's quote, responsibility to acknowledge her own agency and wrestle in explicit and conscious ways, not only with the multiple meanings of the original in its own culture, but with her own text, or but what her own text may mean and the effects it may have on its readers. Because the Odyssey, and I might add, uh, the text that we're discussing today, um, are such foundational text, Wilson asserts that, quote, it is particularly important for the translator to think through and tease out their values and to allow the reader to see the cracks and fissures in these con constructed fantasies. It is in this spirit of reflection, considered critique, and acknowledgement of a translator's agency that we welcome our, these re or untranslations. They are daring interpretations and creative works in their own right, pushing both reader and translator to look at familiar canonical works with new eyes. And we hope to see uh, more such projects taken on by translators and encouraged by publishers in the future. As usual, a Q&A session will follow today's conversation. Please email your questions for Gopal, Laurie, and Vivek to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. Translating the Future will continue in its current form through the rest of this month. During the conference's originally planned dates in late September, several marvelous larger scale events will happen. We'll be here every Tuesday through the rest of this month for the rest uh, with the week's hour long conversation. Please join us next Tuesday, September 8th for Translating Trauma with Ellen Elias Bursach Aaron Robertson and Julia Sanchez, moderated by Queenie Sucadia. And keep checking the Center for the Humanities site for future events. Translating the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators, working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn miller Lockman and myself. For more information, look for translation resources at pen.org. If you know anyone who was unable to join us for the live stream today, a recording will be available afterward on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites. Before we turn it over to Gopal, Lari, and Vivek, we'd like to offer our utmost gratitude to today's sponsor, Middlebury College, and to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and PEN America, and to the masters of dark Zoom magic at HowlRound who make this live stream possible. And now, hand it over to our speaker. We're still just waiting for Gopal to become visible. Oh, sorry about that. Um, hello? 
You are definitely with us, but we can't see you. Oh, that's strange. Uh, my video is on. Uh, I don't know what the problem is. I see, oh, it stopped again. I don't know what's going on. Okay. You know, Gopal, I think what we might want to do is just start and maybe you could work with uh, Travis to see um, okay. how you become visible to us. Okay. Um, but you can hear us okay, yes? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much uh, to Allison and Marissa. Um, just wonderful to be part of this. I think we're all so excited uh, to be talking to each other. And uh, I also just wanted to say on behalf of Middlebury, um, how honored we are to be able to co-sponsor this or co-host this uh, session with these really wonderful, um, my fellow co-panelists today. Um, this would have been uh, right after the ending of our Breadloaf Writers Conference had we um, hosted it in person. Uh, and as you know, Breadloaf also sponsors a um, translators conference earlier on. And so um, we feel like we are amongst kindred spirits and we've left at the opportunity to be able to really uh, support this incredible work that everyone's doing. Um, so I'm gonna switch hats now um, from uh, my admin uh, role to the translator and, and poet uh, reflection role. And I just wanted to start with three or four reflections. Um, Alison Larissa asked us to think about our language and the relationship to our language. Um, so uh, my work, as you may have read from the bio is in Sanskrit um, and uh, early Indian religions, although I'm now doing a contemporary ethnography of uh, the lives of women Sanskritists in post-colonial India. So I have some contemporary um, understanding and engagement with the language. Um, the one thing that I would say is um, I've always had a um, focus on uh, trying to open up Sanskrit. It's understood from the very early period, even in the earliest satires we have um, about Sanskrit, that it's an elite language, it's a Brahminical language, it is one that is muttered, um, should not be fully clearly heard in all situations because it is a sacred language. Um, there's a lot more to say about that, but um, that uh, understanding of Sanskrit is a very interesting and important part of someone who is um, from an Anglo-American heritage, um, learning in a post-colonial environment um, where concerns about neo-colonialism emerge in some very interesting ways. Is Sanskrit even a language that we should engage in a post-colonial environment? Um, that's one of the big questions that certainly arose for me in graduate school and, and beyond. Um, and so after having published uh, a couple of books um, in this area on poetics and um, ancient Vedic material, the earliest material that we have, um, I was asked to translate the Bhagavad Gita. It would have been the 251st translation, it is. <laughs> um, and the question is, why do that? And my first response is always, well, there is no intellectual reason to do the 251st translation of of this Sanskrit classic. Um, however, there are generational reasons. Um, and the last Penguin classic um, was uh, in the mid 20th century and um, was done by someone who wanted to really see Christian residences. Um, and it was a, a, of its time um, and it was time for something new um, for Penguin. And so I really narrowed my scope into saying there's no intellectual reason. We have many wonderful translations. Um, I eschewed right away the definitive, the idea of any definitive translation. I disagree with that idea deeply. Um, and I think there are many translations that are as good if or not, if not better than mine. Um, but I did feel that it was important to take a new view of gender in my translation. So um, I do not use gen uh, gender pronoun him. I use one except in one place in the text. Um, second, um, I wanted to focus on the poetic simplicity that I think had been uh, not as present in many of the Victorian English translations. Um, and finally, I wanted it to be 
concrete language. There's a lot in the Gita that is, uh, uses a lot of early Indian language, Vedic language that is deeply concrete and I think even more poetic. So for those three reasons, I thought it was worth um, giving the world um, a very small alternative uh, to the many other wonderful translations that were out there. Lots more to say, but I'll begin with that in a brief way and then uh, maybe turn uh, to Gopal, who is now newly visible next, and then we can go to Vivek. Oh, you're muted. Uh, I think you're still, we can't hear you. Um, so Gopal, I think now if you're working on the sound, we've got the vision together, but since we're working on the sound, I'm gonna to turn to Vivek next as you work on the sound. Uh, so um, hello everyone and uh, uh, excited to be on this panel. Um, I think of myself in some ways a bit of an interloper in the world of translators uh, because I'm not a, a language expert of any sort and um, probably don't have the discipline to learn new languages by the traditional means. But I'm very grateful to the community of translators that I have been um, among in recent years because they've been so welcoming. Uh, in my case, I found myself in my engagement with different texts uh, driven by a kind of necessity as a writer and more specifically as a writer in the tradition of Indian poetry in English. Uh, and you can see this more or less uh, from the very beginnings of Indian poetry English in English in the 19th century with a writer like Toru Dutt, um, which is, uh, you know, driven by a necessity to investigate, uh, reconcile, challenge uh, one's own past and the forces and the discourses that uh, have shaped me and to be in a kind of uh, critical dialogue with all of that. And uh, as we go on, I want to talk about two texts. Um, one, uh, Valmiki's Ramayana, which I've been working on for the past decade and uh, recently completed a book of poems on, which is not a translation, uh, but what I've called a, a writing through um, a kind of critical conversation uh, through poems uh, between Valmiki and uh, contemporary poetry in English. Um, but one that incorporates translation and also plays with and tries to open up the translation idea of translation in various ways. Uh, and then also maybe I'd like to say a bit about a project I've just started or uh, returned to, uh, which is the uh, Kurunthoke, uh, an ancient Tamil anthology of short poems, four to eight lines in length, uh, which I've just started working on in earnest. And uh, uh, well, I'll talk, you know, as we go on, I'll talk more in more detail about uh, my method and my inspiration, how I came to uh, Valmiki and the Kuruntoke and so on. But, um, but I just wanted to maybe, you know, propose a few things. Uh, one is that, um, uh, and these are, these are personal things. I, I, I really want to echo uh, Laurie's idea uh, against the idea of um, a, a definitive translation. And uh, maybe propose something more personal, uh, which I found for me, which is uh, the first point would be that um, every translation, you know, is a unique encounter, as I see it, between uh, the concerns, personality, etc., of the translator and that of the text. And various things follow from there, including uh, the ethics of translation. Uh, so what I found myself doing is not the kind of uh, objective translation that seeks to produce a single authoritative version that replaces all the others. Uh, and you know, there's this kind of, I, I think, you know, a false idea that we have of translations becoming obsolete. Uh, you know, and being kind of replaced in every generation. I think that's pernicious. But I want to propose something more personal. Um, and I would say both the strength and limitation of, of what I do. Um, and uh, one of the things I've thought about as translation as a kind of soul fusion 
uh, technology. A translation is a place where um, souls, to start with the soul of the translator and the soul of the text, are fused. And um, this is especially true, I think, with the so-called ancient texts, because they're distant from us, not only in terms of language, but also in sort of terms of time. Uh, and the other thing I want to propose um, is that um, translation is a fundamentally collaborative process. And again, not only between the translator and the text, but also that you can't but be indebted to all the translators that came to this text or the specific area of a language before you. So what I find is that even if one rejects the work of a previous translator, one is still indebted because they've given you something to reject. So for instance, with the Kurun Tokai, the most famous previous translators, A.K. Ramanjan, who really introduced the poems to the world. And although I would say I would disagree with and reject a lot of his choices in my uh, work, uh, he's given me something to reject, which he didn't have uh, when he went at it. So again, the idea of multiplicity. Uh, and final thing I want to say to start off as a proposal um, is that for me, the biggest revelation uh, through the process of working with these texts um, as a writer and not a scholar uh, in the past 10 years or so of getting into the weeds by various means um, is just how much is still not known about them. How little, for instance, that the reading of specific lines has actually been settled. Uh, and I would say this is true for uh, Valmiki and the Kurtoke, definitely. Uh, and I was also thinking recently of you know, a, a poem like Wolf and Eidwalker in the Anglo-Saxon tradition where um, you know, virtually every word in a way is not settled. And I think this is not the general public's understanding. They usually tend to assume that the meaning and interpretation of these canonical texts is already well settled and has to merely be conveyed in an updated contemporary language. So although there have been all these different layers of critical interpretation and uh, silting, there is still, I think, this matrix of raw mystery. And this applies to poetry, especially because poetry is mystery. Uh, and so that can be opened up again and again. And I think for the texts I've been talking about, it's not too much to say that these texts can keep telling us new things uh, that earlier generations perhaps could not even hear in them. Um, so that, those, are, those are some uh, kind of proposals uh, for, for things I've been thinking about. Vivek, I love those. I'm hoping that Gopal's volume is now ready. You're unmuted for us. So can you say, uh, can you hear uh, Gopal Vivek? Uh, I, I can't hear him, but I do. I, I see the, the unmuting sign. Oh, I see the unmuting sign went on now. Yeah. So, uh, well, what I would suggest that you do um, perhaps is uh, mute your, unmute yourself, but um, uh, mute your, uh, stop your video and see if that makes a difference. Can you now say something? No, looks like we still can't hear. I'm hoping that Travis can still work with you. Um, so what I'm going to do, Gopal, is um, I'm going to respond to Vivek, but turn back to you in a second. Um, and Travis, I'm assuming that you can continue to work with Gopal to make sure that we can hear him at some point, And it's not just my computer. Um, so hopefully the two of you can continue to work on this. Um, one more try, Gopal. You want to just try and say something and see if we can hear you? Trying to say something still doesn't work. Oh. Okay. okay, so um, I'll come back to Gopal. But Vivek, I, I, I love many of the things you said. Um, I, I will tell you that Ramanujan was one of my teachers, um, one of my major teachers at Chicago. and. Uh, 
one of the things that really struck me um, in the middle of trying to decide, and I, I'm sure you have some thoughts about this, about whether to be a scholar or a writer, which I was obsessed with in graduate school, he looked at me at one point with you know only a stare that someone like him could, could give and said, just write. It was so simple, you know, it sort of didn't matter what genre it was. I had just done some um, work in publishing poems uh, and, uh, you know, was filled with all the identity crises that only someone in their mid twenties trying to figure out a professional identity can have. And mm -hmm. there he was, and he just said, it's very simple, you know, just write. Um, but I do, uh, so I'm really excited to hear uh, from you given that the introducer of an ancient language classical text that is not known to the world um, can have certain liberties and also certain limitations, I think, as you rightly said, in a way that the person who is saying, no, I actually want to do it this way, um, uh, that you're taking up um, is, you know, you have a whole different perspective on it in a way that, that uh, is, that has its own limitations and, and advantages. Um, the other thing that I, I think was um, a wonderful thought was how collaborative we are with other translators. I know for the Gita, there were two or three um, particular ones that I felt um, that one of my um, other mentors, um, uh, Belteru Narayan Rao, uh, says frequently that the Gita is th that Un frequently our understanding of Sanskrit in the contemporary world is not Sanskrit, it's actually Victorian English, right? <laughs> and it's, yeah. and it's sort of true at a certain level. And so the simplicity um, of my verses I tried in the shloka move, um, I didn't do short, long, short, long. I, I didn't want to imitate. I didn't think it would work in English, but what I tried to do uh, was no more than eight syllables per line and always eight lines. So I gave it a loose preform understanding, um, very much like the poems that, um, that I have written in my three books of poems, um, very similar kind of deep simplicity. Um, and I was reacting all the time to the ornate, you know, flowery thing. But mm -hmm. what's been very interesting is some folk don't like the turn to a contemporary idiom for the Gita because in their view, the only English that the Gita can be poured into literally must be something more ornate because that's what would the English reflection of the high Sanskritic language, right? So, um, so there was this very interesting conversation happening all the time as I wrestle uh, with that. Um, mm -hmm. but I'd love your thoughts on that as well. Um, how you wrestle with A.K. Ramanujan uh, would be a deep personal interest as in, I hope for, for others as well who are translating and wrestling with their predecessors. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, with, with, uh, with Ramanujan, uh, the thing that's fascinating to me is um, the sort of uh, traffic or the, the sort of portal between his translations and his own poetry. Uh, that we can see kind of moving back and forth, you know, and um, and so so it seems, it, you know, as with me, and and I, 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 um, it, it seems that 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 his approach to the Kurintoke poems is also a matter of him working out his own poetics, um, and um, in some ways uh, uh, channeling Pound, obviously, and. Um, uh, you know, and and uh, and and you know, sort of uh, working out uh, his obsessions. Um, you know, like all uh, sexually uh, Brahmins growing up with this kind of sexually repressed, <laughs> as with me, sex obsessed, and so so that um, and and you know, and so so there are um, various questions that he's asking himself, and uh, various things that he's trying to work out. Uh, in his own poetics, and uh, and as I said, that that is very much the sort of tradition of Indian English poetry. Um, I mentioned uh, Toru Dutt earlier, who um, is writing in the nineteenth century, and um, 
uh, you know, dies very young, dies at the age of, I think, 25, but, but towards the end of her life is working with Sanskrit. And um, she's um, uh, translating a story from the Vishnu Purana. And uh, in the middle of the translation, she stops and disagrees with everything disagrees with some character that's and comes in so so it's a it's a it, it's a very um uh you know a, a personal um uh process and uh, but for many years um ramanjan's translations had more or less replaced the sangam poems in my mind uh yeah it's, because, it's, yeah, no, so so I, I in fact i felt no need to 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 you know, see what what look at other translations even and mm -hmm. and um, uh, even uh, show up in a, original and um, and uh, and so uh, and and I think that that happened for a lot of people that in some way they were so compelling yeah. uh, and so original and so fresh that uh, they had kind of replaced the original. Um, and uh, and the, the break for me came for when I started to look at some other translations and comparing them with the translations done by others, I started to wonder. Uh, and uh, then eventually, you know, I, uh, I found myself uh, back to uh, going back towards the original. It was a long process and um, uh, in my case, you know, a, a crucial thing was actually this this um, this text here by Eva Wilden, uh, which came out just a, a couple of years ago, and it's a critical edition of the Kurantokai, these short poems, and um, uh, just to show you a little bit about how I've been working uh, with this text, uh, similar to how I've been working with Valmiki. Um, let's see if I can do this. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so you see that that there it, in this corner is the original, and then the transliteration, and then um, uh, you know here you have uh, variations uh, between the text, and um, here you have a word-for-word -word translation, and um, uh, at bottom here you have a kind of summary of various previous critical readings of this particular poem. And then you have here a, a translation done by Eva Wilden. But what I found was so moving is that she says, you know, she has also furnished a complete English translation, the purpose of which is not to offer a polished version that brushes over the awkwardnesses, but rather a tool that opens up lays open the difficulties of interpretation. So I was very moved by, uh, you know, her kind of effort as a scholar first to go back to the original manuscripts and compare, but also to be able to offer someone like me, um, you know, I, I speak the, the Tamil language and had a um, early encounter with it through the script, uh, but, you know, I, I read very haltingly. So to offer someone like me a way to kind of, have these words and how to kind of put them together, but in one way that that, that doesn't close them up, that, that shows uh, all the different ways and the kind of arguments that critics are being, are having about how to read the lines. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, and, and, and um, um, uh, you know that 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 shows that shows the kind of the, the the mystery of these texts, and in many cases, we don't even they don't even seem to have figured out what these lines are said or how to put them together in certain ways, and uh, uh, so that was a kind of an opening uh, for me, and okay. so uh, one of the things was that um, um, you know Ramanjan and many of the translations. Uh, kind of uh, reconstruct the poem from within and yeah. and uh, yeah sorry no I just was going to say um, uh, there's so much to say and I think that question of um, allowing the both the mystery of the language as well as the fact that in India um, and in other Asian materials it's different than the Greek it's different than the Latin it's there's there's a a mystery because there hasn't been the same amount of translation happening. 
So there's, sure. there's I think, a double mystery. I think Gopal's, and I want to... I think I heard Gopal, yeah. Gopal is happening. I hope I didn't disturb you. Yay, you're Yay, back. we hear you. We get, right. we've, been, we've been jumping all around, but we can't wait for you to join us. So I'm Gopal, very, I'm, I'm very sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm a tech dunce, and uh, <laughs> among other dunce, types of dunces. But anyway, it's one hat that I wear, uh, not very proudly anymore. Uh, but anyway, here I am. Uh, let's see, where am I? Okay, uh, a short introduction. Um, uh, I, I got into Chinese originally through uh, the study of Buddhism, um, but I, I, I did the foolhardy thing of trying to learn all of the Buddhist languages at the same time, Sanskrit, Pali, and Chinese, and uh, it wasn't easy. And uh, so I, I went off in the Chinese direction, but of course I never quite gave up the others. Um, anyway, I'm, uh, the, the text that I'm working on, uh, or the text that I've, I've published on, is known as the Songs of Chu in English. And the, the main problem with that is, um, well, if I can go back to the beginning, um, I, of course, cut my teeth uh, in Asian studies on translations, like most people in the Western world. And uh, one uh, peculiar thing that I noticed about a foundational poem in Chinese, and that poem is known as the Li Sao, uh, sometimes translated as Encountering Sorrow. Uh, there are at least uh, two translations of it uh, out. And what I, but what I noticed with all of the translators is that um, they admitted that they had no idea what the poem means, or very little idea of what the poem means. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, a, a much was written on this, uh, and I, I found this a very curious uh, problem. Um, the, how could it be that uh, a poem is considered great, uh, but no one knows what it means? And when I, when I looked at the Chinese commentators, I found that there also was a great deal of disagreement and bafflement uh, about what the poem means. So I looked at the poem and um, realized that there's something very odd about it. Uh, as you all, all of the participants here know, that when you read an ancient text, you are dependent on commentaries, on ancient commentaries. And when you read an ancient commentary, uh, especially when you are a beginner, as I was in those days, uh, you, you trust it, <laughs> right? You try, you, try to, you try to follow it because um, you have nothing else. And uh, in, in doing that, uh, I found that there were, what I, I, I decided I wanted to get into this commentary literature to find out what is going on. And the disagreements were um, appalling. Uh, and the disagreements uh, not only went across space in terms of different people at different, you know, at the same time disagreeing, disagreeing but also uh, across time. And uh, I found, that I had to find out what was behind the commentary and behind the disagreements. Uh, long story short, uh, the problem was ideology and politics, which is to say that, um, as is the case in, in a number of in, uh, many ancient cultures, uh, the commentator had an, an ideological ax uh, to grind. And uh, following uh, the tradition, uh, he, he basically um, used the hermeneutical tools that were available to him and commented on the poem, glossed the poem in a way that would be convenient uh, for him during the, the period that he was writing. Uh, to, 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 put this, to put this a little bit uh, more succinctly, because I think we want to get on with the, the conduct, the, uh, uh, the discussion, uh, the, uh, the poet was something of a patron saint of loyal descent during the Han Dynasty. And the people who were commenting on his poetry were um, opposing those uh, who were attempting uh, to create a new ideology 
wherein the emperor would be considered above criticism. Mm. And so they were using uh, the poet and the poetry as a kind of, um, as, as, as their hero, as a kind of effigy of their, uh, of their movement. And so they commented on, on the poem that way. And it was through um, un, basically uncovering all of this that I was able to get back to a coherent reading of the poem. And um, I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it there. And, uh, and uh, we, we could perhaps go on in the, in the discussion. But that, that's essentially uh, what was going on. And so um, I finally, by doing that, I finally managed to come up with at least one coherent uh, explanation of the poem, perhaps not the coherent one, and which is perhaps a little step <laughs> forward, uh, you know, in, uh, in uh, at least Western scholarship. Okay, so I, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there. Go, Paul, we were just talking about the fact that we have an allergy to the idea of the definitive, and I love the way you framed that as one step. Yes. Um, but what strikes me about all three of us, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is um, the, the role of commentary in poetry, particularly in ancient classical work, right? So, um, there, you know, we, we all laugh with, there's so many commentaries on the Gita and it's sort of assumed to be ideological in yeah. precisely the way you're talking about. Um, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's laughter because it's, there's, there are so many that you are sort of overwhelmed, but you know that each one is going to give you the key, you know, and, and claim that key in a particular way. Um, so that, that, that question of commentary is, is commentary can, can do two things in a poem. One is enliven it in a way that you never thought, you know, or help you with hey, Pax legomena, you know, words that only occur once where meaning is, you know, there are two or three levels of obscurity, right? Um, and then there's also uh, commentary that deadens. And this is something I think about a lot. Um, yes. Commentary that gives you alternative words, but there's simply sort of, it's almost like a thesaurus almost. And so I've noticed um, in my own <coughs> writing of poetry, as well as in translating ancient poems, um, that my relationship to commentary is um, highly, uh, uh, dichotomous, right? I go back and forth uh, in my relationship to it every time I, I try and do translation. I don't know if either of you have, uh, Vivek mentioned commentary earlier too, so I'm really delighted that that has come up for all three of us. Yes, yes, and uh, I, uh, yes, in fact, um, well, perhaps Vivek can, can speak. Uh, to that because it, it is, well, let, let me put it this way. Um, you have to use the commentaries. I mean, we have to use them. And there is, and as you say, there, there's often, there are often very, very valuable things in it. Uh, but you have, you know, as Vivek uh, put it, wh what kind of, what silting do you get rid of and what silting do you keep? And that's, that's, uh, and the silting is, you know, in case of ancient uh, languages, uh, such as Chinese and Sanskrit, uh, it, it's thousands of years old in many cases. Mm. Vivek, any thoughts? Well, you know, I mean, one thing I, I should explain about um, the Valmiki, how I got into the Valmiki was um, uh, Arshia Sata, who is the, uh, translator of the penguin abridged Valmiki and um, but also I think really a groundbreaking scholar of Valmiki in that um, I would say her her readings of it are are more uh, like closer to less indological if that makes sense and more uh, closer to kind of literary criticism and and um, uh, my project is dedicated to her and she about a decade ago she uh, called a workshop to for Indian English poets to uh, engage with Valmiki. So that was a kind of, uh, that, that was its way to 
an entry point into it, which uh, kind of opened that out that th there was something more immediate about uh, that reading. Whereas much of what is written on the Ramayana is kind of relies very heavily just on the kind of commentaries and in the way trying to kind of convey what um, supposedly what the tradition from within uh, transmits. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is, of course, the Ramayana is an incredibly layered in terms of the various commentaries that have uh, appeared of it and really the various Ramayanas. And, and, um, and that's one thing that's kind of interesting about it, which is that um, I think what you could call translations, when the Ramayana Valmiki moves from uh, Sanskrit into Tamil of Kamban or Tulsi, uh, I think that these can legitimately be called translations because it, they've clearly studied the Palmiki very closely. And when they want to, the, the Hindi Ramayana, Tulsi's Hindi Ramayana, they follow it very closely when they want to. But then at other times, the translation diverges. It, it draws from elsewhere, it uh, cuts scenes short, it, it rewrites scenes. So, so the, the history of the, the versions of the Ramayana, the sort of translations of the Ramayana has also been a process of kind of rewriting and reinventing. So, so, so the, so, which is to say that, that, that every translation in a way is also a commentary. A translation, I think, encodes a certain reading of the text and sometimes a willful reading of the text, even though it may not be explicit about that. Um, and, right. so, and, so, and so so you have, so, so, so essentially what it does, what these commentaries and these different, Ram, it produces multiple Ramayanas, many Ramayanas as Ramanjan said. And, um, and, and, uh, and, and I would argue what I think is fascinating is that Valmiki itself as a singular text also contains many Ramayanas in it. Like it is already multiple. And um, so, so while in a sense, if, 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 if we're going to kind of rest on a particular commentary or rest on the most recent commentary, it can be suffocating. Um, there's another way to look at it, which is that essentially it produces multiple texts, uh, produces a kind of multiplicity of texts. And that's what, so, so I think that, that, that that's perhaps, for me, that became a very empowering thing. That when I could see these different commentaries and different versions, we're actually creating this kind of multiplicity that were in dialogue with each other. Um, yeah. That then created a space for me to create my own Ramayana. Yeah. Uh, which, let's face it, is just another reading of the Ramayana with its own limitations and something I kind of um, throw onto that massive pile of Ramayanas that already exist. Uh, well, you yeah. make a really interesting point, um, which is, and now Arsha, by the way, is a, a friend um, from graduate school, and so we work together. She's amazing, and we use I use her translations um, for my early India classes. And I agree with you completely around the, the compelling interpretations of, of Valmiki and Ramayana. The, the thing I would say that's so interesting about this though, is that that call for poets to engage, you know, with the Ramayana that you're mentioning, it also suggests that poetry itself is a form of commentary. And I right. actually, you know, the three uh, works that I've done on um, all of them are, the first is Poems to a Hindu Year, which are, com they are really commentaries on Hindu holidays. Um, the second is based in the Jewish tradition and um, uh, very much commentaries on biblical passages, you know, various kinds. The third is based on home and uh, commentaries on architectural elements like roof uh, mm -hmm. window, hallway, et cetera. But I realized a uh, long time ago that my that, that the poetic voice I am most happy with, including in the Gita translation, is one where there's a structure upon which I am commenting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, the Sanskrit is fayam hu, the sort of self-originating um, understanding of poetry um, I've always been somewhat suspicious of. 
even though the earliest Vedic poets in India understood themselves to be uh, in some ways Fayamhu, but they mm. were apprehending something, a, a deity, usually a vision of a deity to which they were responding. So even there, there's a dialogical, but also commentarial element to poetry, which I think is you know, so interesting and, and fascinating uh, in its own right. I can't wait to hear what Gopal says about this since he brought up the commentary and got us going on this. Gopal, are you still there? Yes, we I do. Okay, uh, perfect, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, we can hear you, we can't see you, but hearing you is, is lovely. I don't know what's going on, but- uh, yeah, But we can hear you, so. Uh, yeah, just okay. jump in. <laughs> It's very interesting. Of course, uh, both of you are talking about commentary, and I, and of course, uh, you you are the uh, the, the Sanskritist, and uh, so I. What I'd like to ask you is, uh, from your point of view, would you would you ever was there ever a time in India when commentary was controlled by a central authority? Um, you mean uh, culturally, or uh, in terms of? Uh, religiously, or uh, well, yeah. Uh, let me let me give you an, an a counter example. Yeah. Uh, in China, the uh, it was the imperial government. Yes. That uh, what was orthodox con co uh, commentary and what wasn't. Right. And this system broke down only after a few thousand years. Yeah, and um, so it's an interesting question. Um, uh, I would say a couple of things about that. The first is, um, I think I, I did a paper comparing not being in any way uh, focused on Chinese or educated as you are, but comparing uh, Shinza's view of language and an early etymologician in Sanskrit, Yaska, wow. view of language. And the, the scariest thing for Shinza is to, that it's, that, that, um, there could be several meanings to a word. And I'm sure you know much more about this than, than I did than I do. And the best thing uh, for Yaska is that there are, and the more al alternative etymologies that you can give for a word, this is the first etymological dictionary in the fifth century CE, roughly, um, the, the more powerful the word is. And of course, I'm you know very much attracted to the second and, and fascinated by the first, but so I'm a, somewhat familiar from having read Shenzhen at, at what you're talking about. I think you certainly within particular um, monasteries, particular um, schools of thought, particular Vedangas and in early Indian history, there would be orthodoxies, yes. Um, and there are certainly kingdoms where patrons would um, uh, want a particular kind of translation, yes. Uh, but the kind of thing that you see, or that I am only a student of and learning just a little bit about in China, you wouldn't see at all. You see instead something like a proliferation. Um, and when I was part of a uh, comparative China-India panel, we all decided we would read the other's texts. So I was reading Chinese texts and Sinologists were reading Indian texts. And we laughed because we all came to this very interesting thing, which was exactly the stereotypes we were trying to get away from, where the Sinologists would say, you know, the Indian texts seem a little too loose and free, and the Indologists would say, yes, and the Chinese texts seem a little uptight about language, you know, and there we were again, back in our stereotypes. But um, that's a long answer to your question, but it's a question that delights me, and um, so I'm grateful for it. Well, this is, this is very interesting because uh, what Vivek was uh, talking about, you know, the, the proliferation of Ramayanas, and uh, and also what what you you said, uh, we uh, what I'm talking about, what I had to break through in China, um, is at least at least in one instance, or, and maybe in a few, uh, the um, a commentarial tradition that precluded certain readings. In other words. Uh, instead of allowing a proliferation, it controlled uh, the readings and controlled, controlled, if you want, different versions of the story. And this, uh, this was so intensely applied to the particular poem that I was concerned with uh, that it turned it into an incoherent poem. 
Now, when I say incoherent, of course, uh, you know, one could argue about exactly what that means. But I do believe in a thing called world literature. And before, before the, the, what my project was, um, was, was to take this poem out of the context of the pure, a purely Chinese culture with all the controversies and to make it available for various readings. Right. In other words, to, to break the hold that the commentators had on it in China itself. And um, if, if I, if, well, uh, perhaps uh, I can give you an example. And, and I, should, I should say that this, what, the, what the, the Chinese commentarial tradition did was a bit what the rabbinical and the early church fathers did to, for example, the Song of Solomon. I mean, which is an example that's used over and over again. Um, in, the, in the early church fathers, you had this idea that the Song of Solomon is not an erotic poem. It is about uh, Christ's love of the church. And of course, what's part, part of that, of course, is a whole hermeneutical uh, culture, which, uh, because of course, if Solomon wrote it, which everyone believed, how could he be talking about Christianity? But of course, there is, um, there is the hermeneutical theory that what is in the Old Testament um, prefigures what's in the New Testament. And this was all part of that hermeneutical maneuver to turn the Song of Solomon into a Christian poem. Uh, a similar thing goes on uh, in China in um, traditional Confucianism. Um, I, I could give you an example of it, but uh, perhaps, you know, perhaps you want to talk about well, that. Yeah. Um, I, I have to salute the speakers today for their intrepid response to our, our technical difficulties. And all of you have, have performed so well, and I we're grateful to you for, for powering through because it has been a fascinating conversation already. And we're sorry to, to break in. Um, we tried to give you a few extra minutes to uh, continue the conversation, but we do have a couple of um, very interesting questions that have come in. So actually I'm going to um, have one from Peter Cole, who is, uh, watching and I think Larissa is going to read his question. Yes, uh, he says, this is Peter Cole and I'd like to thank everyone for the excellent conversation so far. My question is initially for Vivek, but really for Lori and Gopal too. I would love to hear more from you on what you're calling the soul or soul dimension of the work of translation. You spoke of it in relation to the mystery of the poem. People are so wary of bringing the language of mysticism and even psyche into translation. And yet it has been so central to the history of translation throughout the world, and certainly in my own experience. Could you say a bit more? And Laurie, Gopal, how does this sit with you? Uh, yeah. who, who wants to go first? I think Vivek should answer and then I can well, jump. Yeah, I, I, I mean, um, yeah, uh, I think of it as, as soul fusion uh, technology because on you know, there's also there's also tech, there are technical aspects to it somehow, um, to the, the process of, of translation. Um, but uh, I mean, if I were to say, I mean, like sometimes I think that 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 what the, the place where we can actually see our souls is is somewhere kind of trapped in in a poem, and so that raise the question of, of what a translation is uh, as, as some kind of thing. And, 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 and um, in one on one hand, it's, it draws on all this sort of apparatus and there are uh, specific things that go together. But, um, but on one hand, another hand, you know, each translation uh, uh, produ produces a kind of unique object. And I've often, at least in my experience, sometimes I feel like um, I can, I find myself using translation to bury my secrets in plain sight. <laughs> so. I love, that. I love the question, Peter, and it's so lovely to hear from you. Um, I would say that it's really interesting. And it's, um, I think with the Gita translation in particular, um, I wanted it to be really simple and direct um, and poetic you know, all at the same time because it's frequently translated in prose or as philosophy and so on. Um, 
And I think that move, um, I was worried always about mysticizing the text because of the influence of the images, right? So I was gonna go off with Vivek before Gopal jumped in on this question of images, um, poet, poetry, and the tradition um, that, you know, some of us uh, still labor with it and, and for and under. Uh, but there was only one person who wrote and said, your, <laughs> your translation is too contemplative for a warlike poem, you know, of the Gita. And of course there are, back to our commentaries, right? We had so many commentarial traditions that make it contemplative and others make it warlike. Um, so I didn't mind that I was too contemplative. If you're gonna to be too something, it would be fine for me to be that. Um, but I worried about it all the time because I think in moving to the concrete simplicity, um, there is a, there's a sort of over evoking that I worried about doing, um, especially with philosophical terms, making them too poetic or too concrete. Uh, but in the end, um, I was happy to take the risk. Gopal, do you want, do you, would yeah. you like to respond? Right. Yes, I'll add to that. Um, I suppose, uh, I, I don't know if I'd use the word soul. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Buddhist, so we don't believe in it. But, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, there is something that happens uh, between the, the reader and the text that is uh, a truly wonderful thing, I guess we call it poetry. And um, it is, it's important um, to, to, to see what that is, and not everyone can. And, uh, in other, and some people uh, will try, you know, I, let's put it this way, there has to be some poetic skill, if you want, um, to make a poem accessible to a reader. But accessibility means not only um, making, making uh, bringing a poem that is, uh, has a certain amount of um, uh, cultural uh, viability in terms, of, in terms of the culture from which it came, uh, but at the same time, it has to connect uh, with some sort of world uh, that the reader inhabits. That's a very, very important thing. And that's a very, very complex thing to achieve. Uh, it's something that is achieved not only in imagery, but also in sound and diction. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, thank you. I do want to add, we did just, this is really just a comment, but I would like to say we've had a, a response from Emil Alcalé, who would like to add that, to, to like to say that soul fusion technology is a superb term that should be generally adapted. So there's an endorsement for you. <laughs> um, I think we had um, one other question that came in early on, um, perhaps a little bit more technical. How do you preserve in the translations in your poems the ancient social and cultural class bound language levels so that today's American, or I should say, um, English language readers can understand them? This is, um, I'll just jump in and then um, be brief, but it's a wonderful question. And um, the, the issue of footnotes is something you struggle with in translations. How many notes do you put in to do that sort of cultural work? So what I decided to do was to put as, I, I did not translate many terms that others had decided to translate, others had not. So um, uh, yoga is not translated. Um, guna, the qualities um, are not, it's not translated, but I explained them in the beginning. I don't, I also provide a glossary, but for the really key terms that have so many of the social and cultural connotations that you're talking about and class-based connotations, Varna-based uh, connotations. Um, it was very important for the reader to know that first. And so that's what I decided to do. Um, but I think secondly, I just appreciate the spirit of the question too, because um, I wrote this Gita for my Hindu students in America who wanted something that they could connect to, and I kept providing better trans, or not better, again, uh, translations that were better for them um, uh, in, in my classroom. And I said, well, it's better to think of them as an audience to get at some of the issues that um, really provide 
plain spoken, uh, in the best sense, accessible ways of thinking. Uh, but they're gonna have to do the work up front to understand some of those connotations in order to be better readers. So that's the way I designed the translation and the terminology to get at some of the issues that you're talking about. Well, all right, uh, uh, this is Gopal. Uh, the <clears throat> certainly, <clears throat> certainly these, um, these texts, uh, if they are read within the cultures that produce them, uh, are very often read, if they're old texts, right? They're very, very often read uh, with commentaries. And uh, the, the, the problem, of course, is that even the, within a culture, uh, something from another time can appear very foreign. And so I, I, I think that the idea of footnotes, which, which many people find anathema, is uh, unfortunately an, an inevitable thing, right? You're, you're, going to, you're going to have to set the thing in some sort of frame. And um, the, other, the other problem, of course, is that even within a culture, um, the, um, it, there is very often uh, a kind of stereotypical uh, depiction of its own ancient time. And uh, we have to often deal with that as well, uh, which is to say, uh, uh, even well, take you know, take uh, for for example, the way Shakespeare used to be presented. It would be presented in simply contemporary clothing, uh, and uh, although we've we've reverted, we've come back to that. But there was a time when they tried to recreate, and of course, you have you have uh, now uh, in early music, right, the recreation of the sound of that ancient ancient Western time. Uh, and so we have to do work a little bit like that, but the problem is always uh, the accessibility for the reader. In other words, when uh, terms get in the way, uh, you, you, you have to let them go, if, especially if you want there to be a kind of lyrical impact uh, of the poem, of the text. Uh, in other instances, it doesn't matter so much. So, I, I mean, I, I feel like basically this is a question about the impossibility of uh, translation. And if you're skeptic, of course, you can say all translation is impossible, uh, especially uh, poetry translation. But I would uh, counter with that is that translation is always possible. And the reason why it's always possible is that we forget that a translation is actually the bringing of something new into the world, something that has not existed before. And to the extent that it, you know, a, a real translation, lyrical translation is something new, uh, it represents a kind of a new conversation. It's a, it represents the exploration of what is possible. Um, and so, so in that sense, you know, every translation has, finds, no translation can find any absolute strategy, but every fine translation finds new things to add to the conversation. And um, and so 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 in my case, in, in some ways, that uh, you know, the answer about classes would be to think about, um, for instance, the kind of uh, class divisions that exist in our society, and how can you how can you produce resonances and create an object that, in a way, looks backwards to that that earlier text, but also reflects on the world we live in uh, today. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, again, thank you for power, your efforts to get through these technical difficulties. But uh, Laurie, Gopal, and Vivek, it was a wonderful conversation. And we're sorry to have to cut you off here now. Thank everybody for watching. Uh, once again, we'd like to thank our partners, HowlRound, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, and of course, Laurie and Middlebury College for their support of today's event. Thank you again, and we hope to see you next week.